Hello everybody, and welcome to another video in the Google Analytics 4 training series. My name is Kevin Lamb, and I'm a product manager on Google Analytics. Now this video is part of a larger series of videos brought to you by our product management team. As product managers, we work with engineers to build and maintain products like Google Analytics 4. The goal of this series is to help you get set up and accustomed to the way Google Analytics 4 works so that you can start using it for your web and app analytics. Now, as we go through the series and this video in particular, we'll be walking through both theoretical as well as practical examples demonstrating things within the product where it makes sense. Now, before we jump in, I would like to also call out that there's a wealth of information available on our Help Center page just by searching for Google Analytics 4 and moreover, if you're an enterprise customer and are interested in additional features, definitely check out our GA360 offering. So in this video in particular, we'll be going over how tagging works for both web and app. We'll start by doing a quick briefing on how Google Analytics 4 is structured. Then we'll talk about how to start setting up your tags for your property. Then we'll talk about how to set up your schema and things to consider in terms of what data you want to collect. And once you've advanced to the next stage and are interested in thinking about your user's journey across different platforms, we'll talk about cross-platform management and how to do that. Last but not least, Google Analytics 4 offers a ton of data controls and settings. So we'll preview some of those for you in this video. So let's jump right in. Let's begin with some basics before we really get into how tagging works. First, you want to set up a Google Analytics 4 account if you don't already have one. Now, typically, an account represents a single legal entity. That could be your entire organization. It could be a specific product line. Now, how you construct it is really up to you. Within that account, though, you want to create a Google Analytics 4 property. If you've used Universal Analytics in the past, this is essentially the next generation. Now, a property should typically represent an entire user base as well as all their touch points across different platforms because in the property is where you want to set up distinct data streams for each platform. Now, let's talk a little bit about what those are. For web, you're going to create obviously a web stream and you're going to tag it with gtag.js or Google Tag Manager, otherwise known as GTM. If you have a mobile app, you want to create distinct app streams for Android or iOS. And you're going to create these by integrating with Firebase. And now that you've got that structured down, let's talk a little bit about what tagging looks like for each of these platforms. We'll go ahead and start with web. Web tagging is important because it's one of the foundational elements to understanding how your users interact with your company through your website. Google offers multiple products in this area, including gtag.js, and Google Tag Manager, otherwise known as GTM. We're going to talk about each one of these and how you can use them to collect information for your GA4 property, starting with gtag.js. To set up gtag.js, you simply need to add a snippet of code to your website. Now, what we have here on the screen is a templatized version of that snippet. And we're going to walk through each of the elements on the page. The first thing to know is you need to add your measurement ID. This measurement ID corresponds to the web stream that we were talking about earlier. Now, the next set of information is corresponds to the user interactions that are happening on your website, specifically the events. Now, these are things like login or a button click or even placing, adding items to a cart. Now, the parameters are actually attached to those events and they help to contextualize what's happening around those clicks or add to carts. Um, so it essentially becomes kind of the dimensions that you will eventually use in your reporting. The fourth thing on here are user properties. And you can think of these as, as sticky metadata about your users. So things like their favorite food. Then when you put all this together, they really pull together a schema that helps you to understand who your users are how they engage with your website. And in a different video series, you can understand how all this information can be used to set up things like custom dimensions, um, event scoped, user scoped, and all that great stuff. But the important thing here, again, is you're gonna add a code snippet to your website. 
make sure you hit these, add these key elements on there, especially that measurement ID. When you're thinking about setting all of this up, there are multiple routes to take because gtag.js doesn't always work for every scenario. Let's talk about each one of these. The first example here is Google Tag Manager. Now, Google Tag Manager is often used when you have multiple destinations for the information that you're collecting, not just GA4. It's a great way to set up a single data layer, collect information once, and fan it out to multiple places. gtag.js is what we just talked about as a base example, and it's typically used to hard code tags, those events, parameters, user properties that we just talked about, and set them up directly on your website. The third category is if you are using a CMS system to help build and maintain your website, those providers could be using GA4 under the hood. If you fall in that category, you will want to reach out to your CMS provider for more information about how to use GA4. So let's jump into analytics and I'll show you exactly where that is. So if I were to go into my analytics account, now here I have a basic GA4 property that I've just set up. There's not much data in it. Now under admin, I'm going to go to data streams and I've already set up a sample web stream. Now on here, you'll see that I've named my web stream, set up my URL, and this is the same measurement ID that I was talking about earlier. But importantly, below that is something called enhanced measurement. When I have this enabled, it allows me to, through tagging, instrument a number of things that are basic. So things like scroll, outbound clicks, site search, you name it. And I can easily toggle these on or off and not have to make any co additional code changes directly on my site. So when you think about tagging on your website, there are often a number of user interactions that are pretty common. So to help you and all of our customers, we've really made that automated through UI-driven tagging experience called Enhanced Measurement. And what this does is it allows you to, through our admin UI, enable or disable certain data collection. And I'll go ahead and show you what that looks like right now. In analytics, I'm in my admin section of a, an aptly named my new G4 property. Now I got to this data stream here by navigating through my account, my property into data streams. And I'm going to go ahead and click on my web stream. Here you'll see that you'll see my stream name, the URL that I've used, which is obviously not real and the measurement ID that we were talking about earlier. But below that is the enhanced measurement feature. Now here I have it enabled, and then when I click on the settings, I'm able to actually select which ones I want to turn on or off. And it's as simple as that. I don't have to go back into my website and make changes directly, um, and it's great. So this works in the case of gtag.js. Now, if you're using Google Tag Manager, especially if you're using it with Universal Analytics today, it's likely that you're going to want to set this up in an easy fashion with GA4, because the last thing you want to do is going back and retagging your entire website. So this is a great tool because it allows you to do that in a couple of easy steps. So let's look at the high level steps of what those are. I'm going to go over to my to Google Tag Manager and walk you through that. So at a high level, it's really two different pieces. The first is you're going to go ahead and create a new tag. And let's just name this my websites GA4 config. And you'll understand that briefly because the first thing you're going to do is set up a GA4 configuration that just sets up all the hooks into your GA4 property. So when I go ahead and create that, the first thing it's going to prompt me for is a measurement ID, which I already have available from here. So I'm just going to copy this, go back here, and it allows me to send a test ping back to my property just to ensure that things are working. And there are other things I can set up as well, like setting up a, if I had a user ID, for instance, I could set that up here on the fields to set, um, or user properties or advanced settings. Now I'm not going to go ahead and do any of that just because it's a fair amount. So we're just going to save this. And lo and behold, I'm prompted that I didn't actually add a trigger. So I'm going to add, just for ease of sake, I'm going to add all pages and hit save. And that's probably not the way I would set this up, but I just wanted to show you how that's done in one quick step.
Now, the second thing is once you have your configuration set up, that just gives you the hooks. The next thing is you're actually going to set up all the various events and parameters and user properties on this site. Um, so let's call it my website's GA4 event, or let's say um, button click and keep it very gener general. Um, so next, I'm going to go down here, click a GA4 event, set this up. The first thing I'm going to do is pick the configuration tag. And you'll see that this is the one that we just configured a few minutes ago. And for this, let's say button click. Um, let's pretend like somebody's made a purchase and I've got this hooked up already. So when I go ahead and save this, I'm going to pick a trigger. And I don't have any of the setup yet, but let's just say it's for all pages for now. And it's as simple as that. It's two easy steps, configuration and events. So once you have all that completed, you're essentially sending data now to GA4. Um, there was a lot more involved within the tagging experience uh, in terms of the types of events that you want to set up, the user properties, and all of that. And we're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later in this video. But first, we're going to step over and talk about apps. If you want more information, though, about web, you can always go to our tagging website and there you're going to find a plethora of developer documentation on how to set up things like consent mode or set up various um, site tags and configurations for more advanced customers. Now let's talk about apps and how apps tagging works. Now in the apps world, it's fairly common for an app to use an SDK, otherwise known as a software development kit. For Google Analytics, we use the Google Analytics for Firebase SDK. The beauty of this SDK is that it does a number of auto collection for you, things like first open, in-app purchases, screen tracking, and screen views and engagement. Things that are fairly common across apps, no matter the type of category they are, whether it's e-commerce or games, etc. On top of that, we offer a number of APIs to both help you log custom events, similar to how gtech.js allows you to specifically uh, log certain types of events or user properties, and there are also data controls that are available through APIs. And we're going to talk about all that in a bit as well. Now, the SDK here is deployed through Firebase. And so when you set up your app stream, you're automatically going to be provisioned a Firebase project. You're going to be set up and provided with that SDK to include in your app so that you can add it into your app and deploy it and publish it through your app store. To do all of that, the high level steps are pretty straightforward. The first thing is obviously you need to set up an app stream within your G4 property. You're gonna pick between an iOS or an Android stream for your needs. Then you're gonna simply add and integrate the SDK into your app. If you don't need any custom events or logging, if you just need a basic implementation, you could stop essentially there. But for most customers, they wanna learn more about their users and get even richer information such as how many levels did they achieve or whether or not they added something to the shopping cart. So the last step is really just to log those types of custom events. Um, this can be as quick as under an hour. Um, and in more advanced cases, it's gonna scale accordingly. So once you've done that, regardless of whether you're tagging your website or your app, there are gonna be scenarios where you're gonna want to be able to modify the types of events that you're collecting and don't have the time to either publish a new app or push changes out to your website because they can be very involved processes depending on what it is you're trying to do. So to make things easier for you with GA4, we have a great tool called Event Modification and Creation. This is yet another UI-driven approach to changing your tags on the fly. So let me go into a GA4 property to show you what that looks like. Here, I've switched over to a demo account called Floodit. Within admin, I'm gonna to go to my data stream, pick the one that I wanna change. So in this case, let's say it's Android. I'm gonna click on modify events at the bottom. And then here, this table actually is an ordering and sequencing of the types of modifications that should fire off. So because I have none of them, I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to create one. Now the first thing you do is name it, then set the matching criteria for all the, the parameters and the event names that should actually qualify for this modification. Once you've done that, you're gonna then specify what needs to change. And that's event modification and creation. Now this is a great tool for when you, again, are unable or 
don't have the capacity to push out changes and need to make incremental or trivial changes to some of the events. Perhaps you named level up wrong and want to name it levels up for whatever reason. Or favorite food becomes favorite foods and you're trying to capture multiple things within the user property. So coming back to apps for a moment, before we close out this tagging section, I do want to call out that by virtue of deploying the SDK through the Firebase platform, you actually have access to a number of other great developer tools with Firebase. Now this includes things like A-B testing, remote config. Firebase also offers things like uh, real-time databases. And so I want to take a moment to quickly flash that on the Firebase site, you actually have a number of different tools here for your build, release, engagement. This does include things like cloud messaging so you can notify your customers, and engage with your users in various different ways. And that brings us to the conclusion of how the basics of tagging work within GA4. So when we think about putting this all together, within GA4, you've got your tags configured. Now you're thinking about Okay, what are the different types of user interactions I want to actually pull? What do I measure? What's most important to my business? So GA4 uses what's called an event model, if it wasn't obvious already. Uh, it's different from UA's hit-based model, which had hits and sessions. Here, you're actually looking at the different types of user interactions and logging them. And then we still do have sessions under the hood that allows you to see how those user interactions happen within the context of a certain session. Uh, this has actually allowed the product to be much more flexible, more scalable, and allows us to have a, a lot more event collection for you. So what does this mean? Um, when we think about from a tagging perspective, when you think about your schema, you want to think about it in a couple ways. First, the products themselves, those tagging products, the gtag.js, gtm, the SDK, there are certain events that are always automatically collected. Now, these are, again, the basic ones, things like page views or screen views. Then we have a set of recommended events that you'll find on our help center. These are events that when you log them, and these are categorized by different verticals, when you log them, they actually can light up certain types of reports in GA4. So if you're a gaming app, for example, we have a gaming curriculum that allows you to collect things and we can actually aggregate these curated reports for you based on the type of events that you send. Similarly, for e-commerce, if you're a retail customer, online retailer, if you log things like purchase or add to cart, you have the ability to also specify the different types of products that are added to the cart. And when you do all that and follow the recommended schema, you're able to gain access to these very specific types of reports within our product. And so that way you don't have to go out and create them. You don't have to export your data to BigQuery and go through the work of you know, building a data studio report, for example. It's right there in GA4, all built right for you. Um, the last but not least, there are always custom events. Now, we recognize that not every business is the same. You're going to have your very own specific needs. And that is exactly what custom events, user properties, all that is for you. To allow you the flexibility to measure what is most important to your business. Let's take actually a deeper look into how e-commerce reporting works within the product. So I'm going to bring up again, another analytics property and show you how the recommended events can help you light up some of these specific reports. So within Google analytics, I've now switched over to a different property for the Google merchandise store. And then this is another demo account that we have. And here you'll see that in the reports, we actually have different types of collections, one of which is monetization. In this case, I've logged through the, the website, things like add to cart, purchase. Um, and within those events, I've actually specified the types of products that people have added to their cart. Um, now here, you actually have a number of different uh, reports on this dashboard, including events, the pages. But what I really want to show you is this e-commerce purchases page. And here I see that items, which is the, the pseudonymous with the products that I've added, that are added to the cart or made a purchase, people made purchases on. I can see that the GA4 property has actually read some of that information and automatically created this, generated this line chart, as well as this scatter plot for me, showing, for example, that the Ecotee in black 
has higher sales, higher add to carts um, than many other products in my inventory. Um, and here we've got, again, just curated set of like columns here. So we have not only across all the different items, how many views were, were shown, but also the number of add to carts, um, the, that, and that actually translated into purchases as well as well as those, that conversion rate. So in a way, it's a tabular form of a funnel. Show you per item how people progressed and what are, what my most successful items are. And this is, again, all done by just simply logging a specified recommended set of events. In here, I didn't have to actually go and create or curate some of these. You can easily add this in to your website today. So up until now, we've been talking about how to set up your GA4 property with the various data streams, as well as how to set up the basics of your tagging infrastructure for web as well as apps through an SDK, for example. And then we talked a bit about how to think about how your event schema should be structured, including the various tools that GA4 offers you from auto event collection as well as suggested events that feed into out-of-the-box reporting. Now for more advanced use cases, right? If you wanna actually understand how your users are interacting with your company on both web and app, that's where cross-platform measurement comes in. GA4 was specifically designed with that in mind because the app and web data streams that you create are the building blocks. And it's made possible because they share the same schema. And that applies to your events, your parameters, as well as your user properties, all with the same types of aggregation that's done, and it's all shown in unified reports within the product. But you can then slice that information through and compare the two side by side if you need to. Now, in contrast to Universal Analytics, it allows us to provide a much richer and more complete view of users, all the way from, say, paid views on YouTube for users who clicked or watched an ad, all the way through to them downloading or visiting your website and then taking action there, whether it's making a purchase or filling out a form, whatever that type of conversion is that matters to your business. Now, it is noteworthy that this is a, an improvement over Universal Analytics where paid views on YouTube, um, these EVCs so, or engaged views, so to speak, weren't always fully measurable with UA, but they are with GA4 thanks to the integration we have with the YouTube product. So now that we've talked about how cross-platform measurement works, let's see how to turn this on within the product, assuming I've already set up my user ID. So I'm gonna navigate back to my Google Analytics property. Here, I'm back in my Google Merchandise Store, and I've navigated over to my admin section, where under, if I look under the property settings, I'll see this reporting identity setting. And I've seen blended, observed, and device-based. Now the device-based is typically what you would use before you've actually deduplicated your events across the different, um, your different data streams. But if I, once I actually add the user ID, if I want to see the deduplicated version of it, I would actually select the blended. And what would happen when I do that is all my reports in GA4 would then be updated and show me actual counts of users as they interact and engage. And it won't count the same user who's been on say Android and my website as two different people, but it will actually represent them as a single person. Next, I'm gonna talk about data controls and settings because GA4 was built with privacy in mind and one of its key tenets is privacy-centric measurement. So within GA4, you have multiple tools at your fingertips. Now, this includes from a tagging standpoint, the ability to disable or enable Google Analytics collection through various APIs on the tag, whether using GTAG or the SDK. So that way, if you do require consent from users, you can do so before you turn on analytics collection. We also offer something called consent mode, which allows you to control the types of identifiers that are collected with your GA4 data so that you can actually match the types of requirements that you and your company need to meet. Now, with number of changes happening in the round the ecosystem, GA4, through the observed data that you are able to collect, we also offer the ability for you to do modeling. Now, where there are gaps, GA4 can model different user behavior based on what is observed to predict what other users who don't have cookies on are actually conducting within your website or app. 
There's a lot more information out there on the Google Analytics for Help Center, as well as our various product pages. So I encourage you all to take a look and read up on what's most needed for your company in this area. Next, I do want to go into the various other admin features that we didn't get into within GA4. So let's navigate back to Google Analytics. So I'm going to back out of the reporting identity space that I was in earlier for the merchandise store. And here I see under data settings, multiple features. So under data collection, I have the ability to actually change the grant, whether or not I'm collecting location data and to the various device information by its specific regions. And so this is a very powerful tool as things change around the world, I'm able to specify where data is collected and how. In addition, I have things like ads personalization. So if my users, for instance, have opted out of ads personalization and I am still using my Google Analytics data uh, to, run, to help optimize my ad campaigns, for example, I can use and through my tagging, set something called non-personalized ads, and that'll actually respect the user request to not receive personalized ads. And similar to the uh, to location data, this can also be set up on a region level. Other things here are data retention. I can change that here within my admin, as well as set up various data filters, things like excluding the internal traffic that I'm using to test my property to begin with. So that when I do go into production or in a more steady state with my site, I'm able to actually exclude the, that test information so it doesn't muddy up my actual user behavior. Um, and last but not least, I would encourage all of you to take a look at the various documentation that we offer through our help center and our GA4 product pages just by simply searching for Google Analytics 4 on google.com. So there's a lot more to learn and I would encourage you to take a look. So we've covered a lot of ground in this video. So what I'd like to do is wrap with a quick summary of what we've just covered. Starting with tagging. You know, tagging, like I said in the beginning of the video, is an instrumental part and a key foundational element of GA4 because it offers the building blocks that helps you understand how your users are interacting with your website or your app. Through tagging, and gtag.js, Google Tag Manager, or through one of our SDKs for mobile measurement, you're able to specify the types of user interactions as events, parameters, and user properties to send the raw data that GA4 needs to liven up the reports that are offered to you. Speaking of which, our products automatically collect some of the most common user interactions so that you don't have to do that legwork. We also offer some UI-based capabilities in the form of enhanced measurement for web, as well as event modification and creation that's available for both app and web. And of course, you can always log custom events user properties to fit your needs. And again, the beauty of having GA4 and this common schema is that it allows you to perform cross-platform measurement when you provide a user ID and are able to deduplicate that use those user interactions so that you have a seamless understanding of how users navigate across various touch points. And last but not least, GA4 was built with privacy in mind. So there are a ton of different data controls revolving around data retention, the types of identifiers that, that are collected. Those are all available to you at your fingertips, both through our admin tool, as well as through various APIs on our tagging products. So that is a lot to cover, and I hope you found this video very useful. Um, and it's been a pleasure spending the last several minutes with you. Um, and again, this is just one part of an entire GA product management training series. So I encourage you to take a look at some of the other video series. Um, and if you haven't done so already, go to analytics.google.com and get started with your GA4 implementation today. Thank you.